Uh, Dr. Watson, uh, congratulations on receiving the Blue Planet Prize. Thank you. So your achievement is quite remarkable. You are not only focusing on climate change, but also focuses on the ozone depletion and ecosystem issues. And so why you are so uh, large in the area? The My scientific background was mm. indeed ozone. Mm. But then I got involved in the climate issue insofar as I knew how to do an international assessment. Mm. So I brought more my experience of assessments, mm. not my experience on understanding climate. Mm. Once we'd done the climate assessment, I looked around and I suddenly realised there was not an equivalent assessment for biodiversity and the Convention on Biological Diversity. So it was very logical to then try to do the same type of activity for biodiversity, and most recently on agriculture. So I thoroughly enjoy the diversification of the issues. And the key point is getting the best scientists in the world to write the documents. Yeah. So you are uh, sometimes said to be a excellent uh, science advisor and so the your role is quite important uh, uh, as you said uh, environment of a leading scientist uh, for the for the discussion so what is the role of uh, the science advisor well the key thing first is to make sure you understand the science and the best way for me is to get the very very best scientists in the world to advise me and then my job then is to take this highly complex science and put it into language that politicians understand. And that was my major role on the ozone issue, the climate issue, then the ecosystem issue, both at a global level when I've chaired these panels, but then at the more national level. And it is really trying to explain what do we know and what don't we know, and what are the implications of different potential actions or inaction. So it really has taken up this very complex science and simplifying it into something that could almost be written on one page. Among these uh, three global uh, challenges, uh, what is the major difference among these uh, three issues? Two of the issues are genuine issues of, global, of the global environment, climate change and ozone depletion. The only way we could protect the ozone layer or the only way we could protect the Earth's climate is to have a, a general agreement across the world to reduce the emissions. And so we need concerted global action. Biodiversity is much more complex because every single country has got a very different ecosystem. So when we say we want to globally protect biodiversity, the action in Brazil will be totally different from the action in Papua New Guinea or the Congo or the United Kingdom or the United States, which makes the science more complicated. You have to understand exactly what the biodiversity in Brazil is versus the biodiversity in another country. Whereas with climate change, the emissions of greenhouse gases or ozone depleting gases in one part of the world have exactly the same effect as another part of the world. So the difference is more of a space one. The similarity with climate is on how to adapt to climate mm. change because the impacts vary from country to country. But at the end of the day, the one thing in common is we need good scientific evidence mm. to help policymakers understand what the challenges are. And when I say policymakers, it's policymakers in government, but also decision makers in the private sector. So the bottom line, the one common thing is we need to understand the science and then explain it to all those that can act. So in relation with the uh, biodiversity issues, maybe agriculture is important. Uh, you mentioned that you are recently very interested in doing the sort of a research or research networking uh, in agricultural activities. What is your uh, major concern in the field of agriculture? Well, there's two sides of the concern. First, of course, is we need to make sure we've got enough affordable food to feed the world. It's absolutely unacceptable that one billion people go to bed hungry every night. So the first challenge is to make sure that we have enough food for the world. But the other side of the problem is that agriculture has had very negative effects on the environment in some parts of the world. It, greenhouse gas emissions for climate, loss of biodiversity because of extensification, water pollution because of runoff of nitrates into the water. So, and of course, soil degradation. So our challenge is how to have a more sustainable agriculture which produces affordable food but does not have a negative impact on the climate system 
biodiversity, land and water. I believe we can be successful. We can use many of the technologies today, the agroecological practices. But as we move into the future, the challenge of feeding the world will become even more challenging. And we will have to look at potential advances in biotechnology. But in all cases, we would have to look at the risks and the benefits of any new technology. As a former uh, chair of the IPCC, how do you think about the current uh, discussion at the IPCC? And uh, how do you think about uh, the uh, importance of uh, the global academic community to understand the climate change issues? The IPCC is absolutely critical to both assess the knowledge in order to explain what we know and what we don't know to governments and the private sector and the public at large. There was an error in the last IPCC report on the Himalayan glaciers. Maybe a few other sentences could have been better written. But fundamentally, the science of climate change is solid. Yes, there are uncertainties, but the IPCC explains it. But to be honest, the controversy around IPCC has led to a lack of trust by some in the public because of the way it was portrayed in the media. We have to regain the trust of the media. We have to regain the trust of the public at large. The Inter-Academy Council did a good job of reviewing the IPCC. It suggested some changes. And in Busan, Korea, two weeks ago, the governments agreed to look very carefully at those recommendations. They've already started to incorporate some of those recommendations and they look at, they're going to look very seriously at the other recommendations. So I'm, very, I'm hopeful that the IPCC will go from strength to strength to strength and be the obvious place that governments and the private sector and the public say, what do we know about our climate? Let's look at the IPCC reports. On the other side, uh, as a former co-chair of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, it is also needed to establish academic community to discuss about the biodiversity and ecosystem services. Now, uh, at uh, COP10 of the Convention on Biological Diversity, they are discussing about the establishment of a new uh, intergovernmental platform for biodiversity and ecosystem services. Uh, what is your uh, expectation of uh, the role of this uh, uh, new platform? Yes, I think the new platform is absolutely essential. In fact, I've chaired or co-chaired all of the three negotiations mm -hmm. for the so-called intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services. The last one was in Korea. There was one in Nairobi. There was one in Malaysia. I think it'll be a little bit different from the IPCC in the following sense that it will effectively have four elements, two very major elements. One is to assess knowledge, but I think much of the assessment has to be at the regional level and even the sub-regional level, and eventually look at the global level, because biodiversity is very important at the local level. Mm. Linked to the assessment of knowledge, we need to see where do we need new research. So we will look at what I call the scientific capability and what are the big research gaps. We'll do that more than the IPCC does it for climate. The second very big area is capacity building absolutely essential that we look at the whole issue of capacity building both at the scientific community and at the policy community so we will try and make absolutely sure uh, that we look at that whole issue of capacity so i think the uh, i think the ipbs will be broader uh, than effectively the ipcc but basically play the same role assessing knowledge to inform decision making in the private sector and in governments uh, in your lecture today, you mentioned the importance of understanding between the North and South, the developed country and developing countries, uh, to share the ideas. Uh, so this is also very important uh, uh, in the field of uh, biodiversity, uh, as indicated at the discussion of uh, uh, ABS, access and benefit sharing. So how do you think about the two? how you could fill the gap between the two? Well, to be honest, it doesn't matter if it's climate change or biodiversity. We need to make sure we can bring all countries together. So we need strong cooperation, north-south, north-north and south-south. Mm -hmm. So cooperation is needed. The first issue is we need to get the evidence on both issues. And the other really important issue is these issues of biodiversity and climate change are not separable. They really interact and we need the two conventions to work together. 
issues as ac uh, access and benefit sharing very very political yeah. but absolutely essential yeah. that we solve that problem it's only fair that developing countries benefit for having this diverse uh, biodiversity in their countries so if it's exploited from another government in the north or a multinational company it's crucial they share in those benefits the challenge is what's a fair benefit sharing and that of course is what the debate is so it's not a scientific debate in the classical sense it is a debate of what's fair what's equitable and that is why it's such a difficult debate to have uh, my last question is uh, you already mentioned about the importance of a synergy among different conventions uh, maybe we could also include the uh, convention on combating desertification but uh, they are having a different uh, uh, secretariat and a different uh, uh, conference of parties how uh, we could find out an uh, appropriate way to integrate these uh, uh, three uh, discussion uh, to be integrated in the very near future yes absolutely correct all of these issues are not separable climate change biodiversity land degradation actually regional air pollution, some of the large-scale water pollution issues, they've all got to be integrated. With the IPBS, hopefully we'll start to address not only biodiversity, but some of the crucial issues on land degradation. Mm -hmm. When we did the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, we asked all of the key conventions, all the biologically related conventions and the Convention on Desertification, what were the key policy questions what type of evidence would you like to have assessed? So I'm optimistic that the IPBS can actually act as a platform, not just for the biodiversity related conventions, but also for land degradation and show the links to the climate convention. So Dr. Watson, thank you very much for coming and uh, congratulations. Thank you very much, appreciate it. <laughs>